Um, how is everybody doing? Uh-huh. 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 <laughs> it's been that week. It's been that week. But the end is here, right? So every day is a gift. These are all the things I'm trying to tell myself, right? So I haven't <laughs> slept in like 72 hours. So every day is a gift. Just keep moving forward. Um, takes one to no one. I have no idea basically what I'm thinking at this point. Good morning, guys. That works. <laughs> Good morning. How about you, Becca? How are you? Floating. Floating. Uh, <laughs> counting down my days on my timeline. What? Uh, timeline for what? For kindergarten. Oh, <laughs> every day brings you one day closer. Yeah. Really? Yeah. Really? Can you guys hear me? Yeah, we got you. Yeah. Um, how are you this morning, Basam? I am doing very well, thank you. So it's been busy. I miss you guys. I missed a couple of uh, calls. Yep. But, uh, yep. Hi, Sarah. Sarah is here with us too. Hi, Sarah. <sighs> but I'm listening. Tell us Our who you Facebook are. Facebook friend. Who are you? Let us know who you are so we can say hi. Claudia is with us. Good morning, Claudia. Kat is on her way. All righty. We will see her soon then. Good to see Hi. you, Basam. It's good hey, to have thanks. you here. Thanks. <laughs> Sorry about that. You guys did We're... a great job on Monday, by the way. Oh, yeah. No, Monday was a show, but it, it happened and we got it through happened. it. And yeah, I was uh, I was listening. I wasn't I was in the audience. Let's put it that way. Yeah. That was the safest place to be. It was so much better in the <laughs> audience than it was on this side of the camera. I know. <laughs> I wish I could have been here. I'm so sorry, y'all. I've had one of those weeks where just everything is going on on top of everything. Hey, so look, look who's here. We miss Sisla. I was just about to pull up her her comment really quickly. So one of our friends in Facebook land said the day my daughter started kindy was the most glorious day. It changes your whole life. Also, good morning, Sisla. So glad to have you with us. Yes, but who are you? <laughs> that was me. It? Okay. Oh. <laughs> um, good morning, Kat. How are you this morning? I'm working on it. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a that sounds like a legitimate yeah. way. Yeah. Friday. Yeah. Friday. <laughs> and, and just so that we can acknowledge it, Facebook friend is Sharon. It's so Sharon. Sharon's here okay. yet again. Yes, welcome, Sharon. So glad to have you. Um, all right, so we are still discussing visual literacy. Um, We're slow and, learners. Yeah, it's it's well, and that's the thing is there's so many pieces, right? And I want to make sure that we get a good cover on everything because next week we're going to start with composition, and I feel like that is one of the more kind of difficult conversations, honestly, out of visual literacy to have because there are so many different ways to approach it and so many different variables that play together to make a composition what it is. So did anybody was, tell the call that we played hooky on Monday? I, I, I was about to. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I saw it. No, it's I mean, from it sounded like it was a really great conversation, though. Yeah, no, we had a, a killer conversation, but I was like, we definitely did not address it. <laughs> <laughs> but we definitely did not. <laughs> No, I love it. I mean, it seems like everybody really got a lot out of it. So I'm so glad. Um, I'm so glad. So sorry, I'm pulling up one more thing for our conversation today. I'm a little bit late getting started this morning because my um, my kiddo tested positive for COVID yesterday. So we've been managing all of the things. Um, and of course, when you worried about your kid you don't sleep very good even though he's doing well but you still are just like no I can never be happy again <laughs> my kid is sick hopefully it doesn't spread to the rest of the family we will see anyway um not to like bring the whole tone of everything down it's gonna be all right so 
Um, yes, visual literacy, let us continue. Today, I thought it would be great to cover one of the things that we have not talked about a whole lot yet, although we did talk about it during our last visual literacy conversation, and that is wardrobe slash clothing slash costuming. Um, I guess the term is going to differ depending on what kind of work you do. But this is all important stuff in the visual literacy puzzle to give us clues about who people are and what we're supposed to believe or understand about the image itself. So we have several, um, several different images that we're gonna look at this morning from some classic paintings to images uh, shared by a few of the members of the Artist Forge. So we'll be able to really look at that and break it down, but just wanna begin by saying if anybody has any questions or anybody has any comments, you know how much we love to hear from you. So make sure that you put those in the comments. We'll bring them up um, and be able to chat with y'all. And so I'm going to ask everybody to start off with, how do you guys approach wardrobe or costuming or whatever term you like to use for your art? Um, and for, I know some of us, we have our portrait artists. And so we may be guiding the steps. Some of us are kind of building wardrobe from scratch for our own personal work. But usually there's some kind of thought process behind how we approach that stuff, right? So do you have like a philosophy or an approach that you use for how you handle wardrobe in, in your work. Um, if you're in the audience today, we want to hear from you on that as well. That's also a question for y'all. So put it in the comments. Well, I mean, no, no. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Hassan. No, I, I was just going to say, in, in my case, I, I do a lot of client work, obviously. And, and whoops, uh, I do a lot of client work. Sorry about that phone call. Um, and I, I could say I really style photos. I really style our, 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 my subjects, uh, but in reality, that's not true. It's just the source of the styling may be different than your typical artwork or, or, or commissioned work or, or creative work. Uh, I work with what I discuss with the client prior to a shoot, right? So we discuss order prior to a shoot, but not to a point where we're actually styling it in advance. We're just discussing ideas, what to bring, what not to bring, the variety that I need, certain things that I've learned from how to make outfits look better, depend, you know, even talking about how, how underwear affects what the outfit looks like. You know, so I go through what I'd like them to bring with them and try to understand what they're bringing with them. And then I use, once I see the stuff, once they're physically here, uh, we go through it and, and, try, and in my mind, I'm going through, you know, what is the background I'm going to use, what works best. And we use, you know, obviously trial and error sometimes because it's not always... Um, great stuff that they bring although sometimes they do right so you have to do with what you have so that that's really my my approach it's really not that sophisticated it's more about experience but it goes with my style also where i tend to be you know it's it's about simplicity it's about being a minimalist it's be putting the focus on the subject themselves and not necessarily the clothes uh so yes the clothes help but i'm i'm always um looking out for taking the focus away from the subject themselves. That's just my style. Unless I'm doing kind of a, uh, a theme, like a, a fashion theme, which I rarely do, uh, that would be a little bit different approach. But fundamentally, I'm trying to put the focus on the subject and use the outfits as, uh, as part of the background in a way, right? Yeah. Can't hear you. It's all right. Well, we're going to survive. Um, so that's, it's really cool that your approach is like to think of how, so you're looking at how the clothing can then support the person and then become exactly. kind of the. Some cohesiveness in the picture with, with, without, you know, without the eye being distracted from whatever the purpose of that image is, what the theme of the image or what the, you know, the, 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 the mood of the subject, right? The right. emotion of the subject. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I tend to use a lot of very little accessories also. Again, it, it same thing, simplicity, minimalism. Uh, so yeah, you know, people come with jewelry. I have jewelry. We lay it out on a table and I can tell you nine times out of 10, we don't even touch it. Right. right. Yes. That's cool. So like overall, you're looking at simplicity, non-distraction and things that support the client and don't pull attention away from, I'm assuming, face, expression, body language, that kind of thing. 
you're muted, Bassam. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see a couple of examples. I sent you a couple of pictures that kind of show exactly what I mean by, by that. Perfect. Cool. Okay. So I love that. That's one approach. And I know many portrait photographers who also take the same, like that is kind of their kind of fundamental um, approach for what wardrobe should look like um, when they're doing portraiture. And Lindsay sharing in the comments, wardrobe is so, so, so important to me. And it does really stifle getting stuff done, budget, sourcing, et cetera. I'm a major snob to a fault. <laughs> and Sharon saying we aren't portrait photographers. We use models, hairstylists, makeup artists, and clothing designers to help create our art. Same here. Um, I, I do that as well. And most of the time I have designed um, the, the costuming um, or am designing it as we're working. So depending on what the client brings, what I have putting everything together. But um, so I, I definitely identify with y'all there. So Matt, Becca, Kat, what about you guys? Do you have an approach when it comes to wardrobe for your, your work? I don't. I, I personally don't. I mean, a lot of the stuff that I do is very much personal branding, people's own stuff. I mean, I help with a little bit of styling, but I don't go into it um, on most clients. I don't really get into wardrobe too much. When I'm doing personal work, yeah, if I have a concept, um, I might use some different fabrics. I really, this just is not a strong area for me. Um, I'm more about simple and facial expression than I am about anything else. Um, it's something that I'd love to be able to build up because I see people that do it well, Lindsay, Kat, Beckett, right? I see all these people that do wardrobe really, really well. And I'm like, it's such a foreign language to me. So I'm sitting here just as much of a student as the rest of you. I'm kind of like Basam. I'm like, you take a few more things off because that way I don't have to get distracted by things being wrinkled or pilled or wrong color um so I literally yeah. i literally do that also by the way take things this off. is, this is too confusing <laughs> yeah to close off so um i think that <laughs> totally different situation so but, but but it is what i do also in boudoir photography i wasn't really saying it as and it was tongue-in-cheek but it, yeah. it's also yeah. what i do it's part of the minimalistic approach right I know for I know for you it is a big part of your job. For me, I just I find that when I start to look at wardrobe as another piece of the puzzle, which I should because it is, um, it takes me out of it. Kind of like what what Lindsay was saying, it's it's a little bit stifling and it just it distracts me from the moment. So I know I need to work on it. You know, I've bought courses on it like Lola Milani's draping courses. I've I've gotten those, which are amazing. So I'm still learning, but it's just not a big part of what I do. It took me forever to put together a toga for Medusa. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not good at this stuff. Uh, you know what? It's so interesting that you say that because we've had the conversation before that when we're talking about visual literacy and all of the different elements that go into creating an image that sometimes we, there's certain areas we just don't mess with much, right? Like, and if you, if, I, if you were to look at the styling of some of the, some of even the more, more famous portrait artists, um, the, the approach is really similar. Like, what can I get rid of? What doesn't need to be here? And that's an approach all by itself, right? Like, what, does, what can I remove to simplify things? And a lot of people, their entire visual style is predicated upon removing as much as possible. Um, and, and even, you know, for people who do fine art nudes, that's the whole point, right? Is to, is to not have that clothing there. So, I mean, that's, that's a legitimate approach as well deciding not to mess with that is is also an artistic decision. Well, and that's like the the Chanel approach, right? Like right. Go to the mirror and take one thing away, right? Uh, I, I think it's important to note when we're talking about portrait specifically, and it can kind of lend itself into, um, you know, fashion and editorial, but to think of styling like a textural element instead of a subject, right? So when you're speaking about it visually, it's okay, how can I leverage styling to help tell this story? And without it being just about the jacket or just about the jewelry. Um, you know, like I had a client last year, she was like, look, I'm an artist, several different mediums, graphic designer, painter, photographer, like all the things. She was like, and I wanna showcase that in an image. And I was like, okay. 
how do we do that? And I ended up just like, okay. And we just wrapped her in canvas, like from the backdrop all the way around, you know, and just to sort of tell that story. Um, but, you know, over styling is a way to bring that texture into the fold too. You know, like, I don't want you to just wear a necklace. I want you to wear all of the necklaces and all of the bracelets and like, just to bring in the texture that all of that jewelry brings. Uh, and what story does that tell? Does it be, you know, are you shooting from a lower anger, angle and like go, you know, and bringing those pieces of the puzzle together helps to sort of really solidify that, that story that you're sharing. Actually, sorry, I want to go back. I, I remember we looked at one of my pictures last, you know, a couple of times ago with the gentleman sitting on the chair yeah. and that was an overuse of jewelry. It was all it all the rings, every single finger, all of the... That's how I dress every day, Basam. When I'm not <laughs> yeah, we, we see that. But more yeah, so that's is a, that's more, a, people. That's a, that's, a, that's a neat way of using the word texture. It's not just about the actual texture, but but how do you kind of... It, it, the, the elements are used as texture, not the actual texture of the elements only, right? Exactly. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Yes. So a couple more comments from our friends today. I'm starting to take styling into consideration in my work, but my previous shoots were styled by clients. I've done just a handful of shoots where I pay for makeup and clothing for special projects. I'm starting to build my own photo shoot wardrobe, which is fantastic. This gives you more control, man. Um, and then Cicela saying, I try to focus on color, layering, and texture to create interest, but I love a monotone color palette, although I use a lot of contrast, but I try to do less is more so the outfit doesn't wear the client but vice versa, <laughs> extra all the way. Yes, I'm like, that was good hair. I'm like how big can we make the hair? <laughs> more is <Yeah>. more. <laughs> I had an assistant, uh, this woman, Morgan, and she was amazing. And every time we would work with a client or she would be photographed, and I mean, like, this was daily. And she was like, no, Kat's going to want the hair bigger. Like, <laughs> you need to be bigger. And she Can had you know, in this piece? really fine hair. So when I would photograph her and she would look at the makeup artist and be like, Mandy, it needs to be bigger. Kat's not going to like this. Kat's going to need it to be bigger. <laughs> bigger is better, man. All the hair, please. Um, okay. So Becca, what about you? Do you have like an approach or a certain approach that you think of when you're looking at wardrobe in your work? <laughs> I'll take your laughter, Kat. Um, yes, 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 indeed I do. And obviously I'm coming from a very different perspective than working with uh, photography clients. Um, and so when I'm dealing with wardrobe or costume, it's, as usual for me, coming from that narrative-driven need. And so we, we have to get like real, real deep into it. And as with just about anything, um, I'm usually going to start with uh, a bit of research. I need to know what the story is in general. And then we have to look at the, the world building elements. We have to like, what time period is it? What season is it? What materials do these people have available to them so that their wardrobe and their costuming actually makes sense at all? Um, you know, would they be wearing leather when they don't have animals that create leather? Uh, you know, would they be wearing grasses? Would they be wearing nothing? Because it's really hot. Um, so all these environmental elements that then come into what provides the ability to even dress in a certain way before we then get to putting it all together in a way that makes sense on the character. Um, and of course, then looking at the wardrobe elements as character themselves and kind of the lifetime that goes into each individual piece. And this, this goes for like props too, um, but any piece of clothing, any article of anything, any piece of furniture, whatever, it has lived in inanimate life. And that lifestyle is going to inform what it looks like. It's going to be rugged. It's going to be chipped up. It's going to be sun bleached. It's going to be, you know, covered in dust. It's going to be perfectly clean and brand new and shiny. And those are all storytelling elements that have to come then into that wardrobe. So after we've gone there, we kind of get, we got our idea more or less formulated, then come into considerations that apply a little bit more to visual literacy, um, in a compositional sense. Um, so especially when you're working in any sort of large environment um, or you know, you know you're know, you gonna be color grading in a specific way, that's when you need to start thinking about things like color. You think about things like contrast, things like light. Um, you know, What is the value of the clothing and how is it gonna look in this environment? Does it make sense or does it really need to look and like be a different color and be a different level of lightness to stand out in the scene at all? Because that's gonna create that eventual compositional impact in whatever the final work is uh so lots and lots and lots of pieces um and of course if things make sense like 
I don't know if you guys have ever dealt with this in photography. I know I have on occasion like been too ambitious with wardrobe like in a certain location and it's just like the person can't move it's like a mess it's waving all over the place it's just not working like you have to consider the actual wearability of the wardrobe within the eventual story and scene and artwork that you're creating too so lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of pieces that i'll go into creating what you're wearing as character yes 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 um so I'll respond to that as well. And but really quickly, I want to grab Erica's comment. And she said, I play in both worlds. My client work is 80% their style with my recommendations, 20% from my style closet wardrobe, which has fun items that photograph well. Creative sessions are 100% styled by me and thrifted, purchased and handmade items that tell the story, which is awesome. Um, and I, I think... For, for me, Becca, my approach is very similar to yours because the work that I make um, is my own. I'm not, you know, working for most of the time with client work. It's an entirely different story. Um, but most of the time I am telling a story. And so it's always to serve the narrative. It's always what story are we in? Who is this person? Why are they wearing what they're wearing? And, and not just that. Often if I am styling something from the beginning, then the question also becomes, how does this person wear this thing? So you may have a top hat on that says, okay, this is a wealthy guy from a certain era, but how does he wear his top hat? Does he cant it to the side a little bit? Does he pull it down to hide his eyes? Like, how does he wear these specific kind of, is he the kind of person that pulls sleeves up on his arms? And if he is, what does that mean? Um, is, the, is the clothing pristine or is it old and raggedy? And if it's old and raggedy, what does that signify to the story as well? Also things like where is the clothing worn? Is it, you know, is it threadbare? Is it tossed over a shoulder? And what does that mean for where we're at in the scene? And we'll see a couple images where I think that kind of helps to make it clear. But the, the narrative for me is always, you know, the driving force behind why I'm choosing the clothing that I'm choosing. So we're gonna look at some examples this morning and we're gonna see these different elements at play and see what we can derive from these um, and, and what our guesses would be about the how the wardrobe or clothing or styling plays into the image itself and what it tells us. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we are going to start with an image of Bassam's, a dual image here. We're gonna have a look at these. And then we're just going to go with the what do we see? And then we'll see if we can figure out the intention, like what the wardrobe or the use of wardrobe is saying, or is it saying anything? So if you're in the audience today, we've started doing this just initial what do we see? Like what is happening here? And then find out if we can see how the element that we're talking about comes into play in this case. So... Um, Really quickly, Sharon saying, yes, part of the storytelling, the wardrobe is part of the storytelling. So what do we see? I mean, I love that this is right up the, the Bassam Alley, like in theme and style with that just simplicity to be dynamic, right? You know, you have a single piece of fabric that's allowing, you know, that that classic and timeless sculptural element without taking away from the subject. And I think it's it's beautiful. Yeah, I agree. I think in this case, it looks like the choice of wardrobe is how can I show off and and how can I celebrate the body of a pregnant woman without overdoing it, right? Like we're still seeing the shape and the form and the loveliness there. And there's enough exposed to highlight the form, but there's not so much happening that it distracts from the shapes and the, the curving, you know, all the lovely curves of pregnancy. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that's exactly it. Just a bit of background. When I, I, I saw, I never did maternity before, I think 2019 or sorry, seven, I uh, can't remember, uh, 19, I think, uh, or 18. I watched Lola Melani on the Portrait Masters, one of the, the conferences, and I just got hooked. And I went out and I found five people, random people, uh, real people that I didn't know. 
to build a portfolio. And not those two women were part of that, right? But, but this really, you know, Kat's got it right. This is exactly what I do. I mean, I, it's minimalist. The fabrics are used so that they are, you know, monotone, you know, a, a simple. They're, they're, they're plain colors. They're earth tones. Uh, they're not distracting. They don't clash with the skin color. Uh, I use them to sculpt and shape the body uh, so that, you know, I do pay attention to, to how I lay them out. Uh, I didn't take Lola's course. and I'm really not good at it. In this case, I think my wife helped me with those two. She was the one actually working on them. Uh, but really what I look for is how much, for example, how much skin do I show to get the lighting to actually hit properly and balance out the picture? Because sometimes you have these fabrics and it's a blob of fabric, looks amazing, but you kind of lose the person in there and you lose the shape. So I pay attention, obviously, a lot to the lighting and how it hits the skin. And, uh, and then how do I incorporate flow and shape? I don't use a lot of fabric throwing, although I've done that. Uh, but you can see in both of these, you know, when one on the left, you have kind of this diagonal line going from her left shoulder down to her knee, right? And on the right, you have the flow of the hair with the flow of the, 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 the actual fabric uh, on, the, on the ground, right? So obviously, I would take multiple images to get... Uh, to get what I want. And like most people, sometimes I composite images, although in this case, I did not composite at all. So, you know, the, the fabrics. So yeah, that's basically my, my, my style. It's a typical client photo. It's part of my portfolio and it resembles what I do, you know, 80% of the time for clients. Yeah. And I love this approach um, because it, of how much it does remove. It's like, Hey, this is, you know, the, the, the choice that's here is to go as simple as possible, but also, the draping and everything is like Kat said, it's highly sculptural. It's very reminiscent of the toga. It's very reminiscent of the chitin, the Greek chitin. It's very reminiscent of those very classical, you know, types of, of dress that give it a timeless appeal, I think. Yeah, I think one of the words I use, which I, I like to show off in my images is, is stoic. I like to show the women, you know, you know they're stoic. They're, they're, they're goddesses. They're, they're uh, yeah. So that's what I hope to achieve usually. Becca, I know you had something to say there. You just said it. It's fine. Oh, <laughs> we say it. You say things better than me. Say it your uh, way. No, I think I think not. But no, I, I like that that use of the word sculptural because that's exactly what it evokes. Especially this one on the left. It is absolutely giving Greek statue and that elevation to goddess level, uh, which is for many reasons, you know, akin to that transformation towards mother um, in many ways and. I, it's beautiful. I, I love that one on the left, especially. It's just so elegant. And, and the fact that it's almost almost monotonous to lends itself to that sculptural element, at least in most people's understanding of like classical Greek, Greek sculpture, it has that monotonous color to it because um, we don't get to see the crazy paint they used. And it's beautiful. But some. Thank God. Thank God we don't. I'm just saying. <laughs> like, I think it ruined it when I look at it. Um, no, I, I think that's actually a really good point because it this is part of that visual literacy question, right? Depending on how often we've been exposed to classical Greek art, um, that interpretation is going to come to us, not because we're like, now what do, you know, what was the artist doing? We have seen so much of it through movies and through history and through, you know, um, museums and whatever else, like wherever we've been exposed to classical art that has been brought forward through the ages, we're going to be unconsciously making those connections in our heads. And if something looks regal to us, like if this, this image looks regal and goddessy and classic and those kinds of things, we're really pulling from our knowledge of that art. And even if we don't know why, if we don't all of a sudden go, oh, it's very Grecian, we're still going to have a lot of those feelings come through because of those connections, those cultural connections that we have um you know visually through through media and through you know being able to see those things in person so um you know it's it's a really cool element of the fact that we're going to tie those things together even if we don't intend to okay we're going to continue to move because we have a lot to see this morning um we won't stay on this one long but i just think it's really interesting for exactly the reason i just mentioned so just <clears throat> excuse me quickly what do we see here? Pinball. <laughs> She's a pinball wizard. 
I love everything about this. Just the whole retro feel of everything, just the styling, the expressions, the posing, like the lighting in the background. I'm just everything about this screams awesome to me. Love yeah. this image. Yeah, same here. And then this one, this one also brings up the question of what's the subject here, right? Is it the two women or is it the actual location? In this case, it to me, it's it's the location. It's the it's it's the mood. It's the it's the uh, uh, yeah. It, I can it's not, I can it's not about the, the woman. Yeah, it's the smoke in the spilled PBR, that stale beer, right? And just the whole vibe of the place. And, you know, there's dudes out front smoking. Like, yeah, awesome, dazed and confused styling here. I love it. So, and we won't stay on this one long, but I think you guys, you know, picked up immediately on the intent where this image is concerned. Um, when you'll see this often in editorial sets. The idea isn't just to sell the clothes, it's to sell the idea, right? The mood, the, if you wear these, this is what you get to be part of kind of thing. Um, and this is a really, really great, this is an arcade in Manitou Springs and in, in just outside of Colorado Springs. And it, it is, this is what it is. It's old and it's fantastic. But the you choose the styling then to tell the story. Here's a couple of chicks. What decade are we in? 70s 80s 80s we in you wouldn't 80s. look at this and go the 50s right yeah you wouldn't look at this and go the 50s you wouldn't look at this and guess that we were in 1920s <laughs> or even like you could get away with now but this 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 everything that goes into there the styling the hair or you know everything is very reminiscent of the late 70s this is very much you know the the kind of the kind of thing that was going, you can't see her long socks um, in this image, but the girl in the overalls is wearing knee socks. But this is so, the type of thing where you could tell the, the models or the subjects, just come in with whatever you wear every day. It's, it's almost like you don't need to style it because that's how you would go into a place like that. I don't know, well, man. Like, the, like it looks like the, the top, the white top is, is it crochet? Yeah. Um, it's yeah. a it's a knit. Yeah, it's not crochet. It's a knit. It is yeah, a knit. and I mean, like the the styling choices though are very intentional here. Like even even these cheeky little overall shorts. Like yeah, you'd you those are in, in vogue now, but it was still like kind of this this time period, at least in the U S. and everywhere, where you're making these bolder, sexier choices. Like and especially and this is giving youth too. Like this, like I am going out and intentionally feeling young and cute and making a point of it. And this was kind of an evolution of style and like social interaction where that was really important. Um, so I don't, I don't think this is like, would have been an everyday. No, but it, it's intentionally every day. Well, yeah. <laughs> That's how yeah, people yeah, dress, yeah. right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like this is how they, if, if this is us as voyeur, like if we just showed up to the arcade, this is who we'd see there, right? Like this is what we would see them wearing. Matthew totally. McConaughey is over in the corner. You just can't see him. And he's smoking a cigarette. cigarette just going, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> yeah, sitting in that chair of his with his, le with his legs crossed, right? Uh, yes, yeah. And so the reason I wanted to show this one even just really quickly is because how purposefully wardrobe is pulling us. Because it's if you were to look at these girls and they were wearing something that you would have worn now, then the anachronism would have been clear. Here's modern people in an old building that has been, you know, restored and maintained and whatever. We wouldn't be thinking, hey, this could have been taken back in the 70s. Like this is, you know, you, you make those choices really purposefully in order to push a narrative forward. And I think the interesting thing here too is you Basam, you caught from the very beginning. It's not necessarily about these girls, right? It's about, um, and Matt, you caught that as well. It's about the time. It's about the story. It's about what happens here and not just these people. So um, Lindsay's saying that effortless look really does take a lot of effort. And, it, and you're right, it totally does. It totally does. So interesting visual cues there. We're not going to stay on this one, but it's super clear right from the beginning what's happening here. You don't see an image like this and have any questions about what it is. A bridal image is a bridal image is a bridal image, <laughs> right? The dress gives it away every single time. Um, here's one we've looked at several times before. 
but the reason I want to look at it this time is specifically because of how very carefully clothing choices have been made and clothing styling choices have been made. Um, and I'm gonna run through so we can spend time on other things because we've done this before. But um, the, the things that are happening here that I want to point out are not necessarily the clothing choices themselves, but how they're being worn. So this dress is so tight. Like if <laughs> this dress is so tight that you can see it pull across her body, right? Like there's a reason to highlight the fact that this dress is tight. It's worn tight on purpose. It is extra tight. Um, and you can infer what you would like from that, but that's a very intentional choice to make it clear that she has poured herself into this thing, right? There's a reason for that. The way that he is wearing his clothes, the fact that his tie is undone and his collar is unbuttoned and his shirt sleeves are rolled up, the fact that his jacket is tossed kind of carelessly across this chair and that his hat is sitting next to him on the table. How these clothes are being worn is very intentional to what the story is. If he was still buttoned up and everything was nice and tight and crisp, we would have, oops, sorry, we would have a different story going on than when the clothing that has been chosen is styled now in this way. So um, I want to leave this open for if anybody has any thoughts before we move on from. Yeah, I, I like the, the you know, the, the, the it, it's simple, but the two white shirts really anchor the photo. I mean, the, the triangle between the three individuals obviously is what you're trying to do. But if had the bartender been wearing like a blue shirt, it wouldn't have as much of an impact. Right. It, it really frames her in the picture, just the two white blobs, which you want. You want the eye to go to. Uh, they go to the white shirts before they go to the red dress, by the way, just because of the brightness. Uh, but they lead you towards the subject. Right. And I think the choice of, of, of white for both makes it makes it happen. Yeah. And that's something that we'll talk about when we start getting into composition as well, because the visual weight and contrast of the elements within the frame are a huge part compositionally of the thing that we have to consider. Because even though they're wearing white and your eye goes there, it doesn't stay there. That's not that interesting. She's, you know, that red keeps well, it's you. That right? leading, it's the triangle and, and they actually lead you into it. They frame her, basically. Right. Yeah. So I just wanted to bring this one in really quickly just to highlight not only the choice in clothing, right? Because obviously this is kind of time period-esque clothing, but how the clothing is worn, which isn't something we always focus on, but the way that somebody wears something tells you a whole lot about their character, what part they play, all of that kind of stuff. All right. So we don't have a whole lot of back one to give on this one, but what do we see here? He needs to be twirling his mustache. <laughs> I don't know. I want to know what he's grabbing in his coat. That would be a gun, Becca. That's yeah, definitely. <laughs> his, uh, his, his, I, his, iPhone. The, his iPhone. <laughs> I need that coat in my life. It's a good coat. It is. This is like a very intense photograph. It is. I mean, so initially, when you look at this, does this look like the ruler of a country? Does this look like a blacksmith? <laughs> Like there, there's always hints, right, happening in, in clothing. I'm going to zoom in just a little bit so we can take a look yeah, at like the state of things. Was I squint? To me, it looks like a rogue and militia leader. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely given 19th century, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, besides the creepy Rasputin vibes that the dude's got going on, I think when we're looking at the wardrobe, there's definitely this military command leadership sort of feel to it. So whether he's a businessman that owns a railroad or he's leading a militia or, you know, some other military outfit, um, there's this sense of command. And that's what the wardrobe speaks to me is command and leadership but with, with that, that creepy no edge. There's no insignia or like anything notable that signals military about this. 
Aside no, it's from the, cut the cut of the jacket. The coat. It's, yeah, it's, it's the cut. It is the yeah. cut. Yeah. Can it we is the, acknowledge it's that this guy looks like Matt? We can acknowledge this. So if our, let's, let's, I, I let's, didn't dare, I didn't dare was I was going to say it's Matt before he got a haircut. Right. Yeah, it's not that far off. Yeah, we can do I mean, this. We can we recreate. Can, we should. Area. We should recreate that. Yeah. Take yep. the photo, Matt. I'll, I'll age it for you. Yeah. <sighs> yes. Um. Yeah. The 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 cut of the jacket, that double breasted, high necked, like it's it's very much the cut. I think that that gives it that almost military feel. So, <laughs> um, he lost his hand and he doesn't want to show it. Sarah's saying. Gene's saying it looks kind of like Grant. He does a little bit look like Grant. I, he's kind of got that vibe. Justin saying during that time period, gentlemen used to put their hand inside their jacket or vest to rest their hand. Thank you, Justin. I was wondering. Uh, gentleman Rasputin. From all At the first, I saw nautical, and it does kind of have that, right? But further looking, not so much velvet collar, just a cranky, wealthy dad. <laughs> command and rebellion uprising so there's definitely like we, we're getting vibes right and the way that and it's not just the coat itself right it's the way that he's wearing it and how he's interacting with it and when you look at this this is not a brand new coat that has never been worn before this is not crisp edges and no wrinkles and no wear this is this is very much something that this fellow wore regularly i mean you can see when we even when we oops, start to look a little bit closer you can see where it's worn. You can see where buttons are used to sliding into things. You can see, you know, the pulling apart of seams from having been worn and the, the quality of the fabric is very much, this is something that, this is not a piece that is put on as a showpiece, right? Like this is a regular wear piece of clothing. Did I cut you off earlier, Kat? I don't know. <laughs> If I did, I'm so sorry. One of the things that I think is interesting about this versus the other pieces that we've looked at today um, is, you know, like we're talking about that, like kind of creepy, edgy vibe, right? Even with the, the color grade on the sepia style or whatever, but like the light is playing a really big hand in this and even more so than the styling is, I would say, uh, just to like deliver that that evocative quality. Uh, and I feel like that needs to be noted. Like if that light were flat on him, it would be a very different, a very different image. Yeah, absolutely. Far side key all day. Far Everybody. side. Yeah, <laughs> everyone go light like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also I think it's important as we were talking about composition before to note kind of the same thing that was um, that Matt and Basson both talked about in the very beginning. This is very simple clothing choice, right? Like this is textural and it's dark, which means his face and his collar are the brightest parts of the image. So it very clearly kind of drawing the eye to his powerful expression. Um, and so kind of clothing serving as that compositional choice as well as, uh, you know, clues to, to clue the person and, and who they are. So a couple images from Matt. But who is he, Nicole? I'm not gonna tell you. Sorry. I'll tell you and I'll tell you later. <laughs> um, so a couple images that Matt brought in, and I think clothing choices here are also things that we can look at. And I would want to get people's just immediate, what do we see here? What do you guys see? Militiaman 2.0 after that last one. <laughs> So I'm immediately looking at the Shemog and guessing this is a veteran um, or somebody who's who's in the field because that's not a piece of clothing you just happen to pick up in general. Um, so somebody who is within that frame, it says that to me anyway. Modern, right? Like this, this, this is very modern clothing. This, this is not a the kind of portrait that we just looked at that was taken, you know, in the 19th. So... What are you seeing, friends in the audience? What do you see looking at these clothing choices? 
a lot of similarities. I agree, Becca, to the last image because we've got a lot of dark there. So leading right up to the face, right? All the all the lines are leading there up to the face. This very utilitarian stuff. Like this is this is stuff you could get things done in. It's not what he'd be wearing to a bar mitzvah, right? <laughs> um, so. Well, really, like, you know, it, this isn't something that you would, you know, this is this is this is a, a utility type of clothing. This is a jacket you could wear out into the weather. These are jeans that, you know, are comfortable and you can get stuff done in. This isn't he's not heading to Saks Fifth Avenue. Right. Like I'm, I'm just imagining like Duck Dynasty bar mitzvah crossover now. And <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, it, I mean, I'd like to hear the background behind this, but this is like a thematic portrait. This gentleman, this is this is his passion. This is his this is what he does. And he just wants to be portrayed in, in, in his element. That's the way I see it. So in, interesting for the, when the apocalypse happens, that's all. <laughs> so Gene, Gene just left a comment and I am. I think it's interesting because he specified a country here. And this still reads very American to me. Yeah. So with Gene's um, experience, yeah. having been where he's been, yeah, it'd be yeah. interesting, yeah, to see. Justin so just, saying modern hunter outdoorsman. Yeah. I'll just give you the, the quick background on this. Um, this guy was a very special Marine sniper who's now over in the Army. He's a Green Beret. Um, active duty, he has been all over the world, won sniping competitions all over the world. He came into the studio. He was going to Costa Rica to go uh, through some ayahuasca therapy for PTSD. He came in and wanted portraits before he went on that journey. He came in, this is my shemog, my jacket, rifle, everything. We put him in here, got this portrait, came back, you would not recognize the man when he came back. So have I'm glad we were able to get these portraits. What's that? Have you photographed him again since he's been back? We haven't been able to link up to do that yet, but yeah, it's no. uh, yeah, it's pretty incredible. But the wardrobe and styling was the one thing that um, actually worked in this to portray that time so, in so, his life. So when you say he's a completely different person, how did he change? Uh, personality wise, outlook on life, connection with other people, relationships, just everything. He went from a very what you would expect out of this picture to someone that is basically a hippie living in a tent and living his best life. And it's pretty, you know, distinct difference. But anyway, that's was the, the, the part behind this. It's a take on Richard Wood has a photo of someone very similar. And I adapted the styling and just brought it modern. That was it. Sure. Um, and from our from our friends in the audience, so Claudia saying veteran, I see strength, courage, determination. Sharon saying the wardrobe anchors and supports the addition of the rifle, which tells the story of who he is, maybe a Navy SEAL. Gene saying, I think it's in his eyes and the winter bundled up. So those might be the things that that kind of had like a, that Serbian rubble feel. Is that what you're saying, Gene? Um, those, those things that reminded you. Um, and then Carla saying, that's an amazing story. Can't wait to see the follow-up portrait. Hopefully that happens because that would be fantastic. But yeah, I think this is one of those things where when we're looking at the wardrobe, um, you know, for especially for those of us who are connected to the military at all, like this is a, a clear symbol. Like this is something that you you only get in certain places generally. Um, and, and then everything being dark. I mean, all of that kind of contributes to help, you know, tell this story. Continuing, where am I at? Here I am. Another image from Matt. So, Ooh, what do we like see? So pretty. Mm hmm. What do we see? What are you picking up on when you look at this clothing and the way that she's wearing it? What do you see? I'm ready to buy bread from her in a cute little bakery mm -hmm. somewhere in like the south of france please feed me no really Jean's saying it reminds him of a german frau well and i like that the apron is is obviously well worn and used right you're not just looking at someone who owns a bakery you're looking at the baker mm -hmm. which is helpful 
Yes. And I love that you pointed that out because I'm immediately looking at the stains and the wear and the right like this is and the fact that she's her shirt sleeves, right? Where are those at? They're not covering her forearms because they can't if you are a baker. And I, I really want that bread right now. Right? Right? <laughs> I can hear it. Like I can hear that bread. The crunch. Uh-huh. And... I can hear it. <laughs> the softness inside. <laughs> I also like the mess to the hair. Like, I feel like that adds to this. Like, let me let me just grab you out of the kitchen real quick. And we're just going to take a picture and you go back. And yeah, it feels Crystal very lived saying, in. Everything feels very lived in. Yes. Yeah. Hard looking, strong woman. Like the the, the clothing choices here. And I, I think the fact, I think you handled the brightness of the apron really, really well. I think it, it matches. Like, it feels balanced with the brightness on her face and the fall off that you were able to achieve. How close was the modifier to her? Um, this was a single 39 inch Rotolux, probably about here, just, That's just off frame. Okay. Yeah. yeah just yeah, off yeah, frame. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Because yeah. it's otherwise you don't get that same kind of fall off where you can handle those wipes um, so well and kind of let it go. She feels a- like olive oil, doesn't she? Like <laughs> this is the, the color and the feel like that that utilitarian but also awesome and kind of the greens that are in there like oh and she, she i make an olive oil bread that looks like if you ever offer to send me baked goods i will say yes i'm just saying that's another good example of less is more where you're you're it's simple right the the the, the kind of the, the shirt blends with the background uh very nicely which really helps put the focus on on her face and and, and what she does Right. Yeah. And it's all... uh, even even the little, you know, the, the white powder or whatever it is the, on the crust of the bread kind of falls right in there with the white apron and puts the emphasis at the right place. There's so much texture. Like, yes, the flour on the bread and the texture to the apron flour, and to yeah. the shirt and even to the backdrop. Like, mm-hmm. it all feels tactile mm-hmm. and not shiny and yeah. new. Go yeah. back. And and the texture of the stains on the on the yes. you know, close yeah. to the bread, right? Mm-hmm. That, yeah, and it seems that it's only stained on that side, right? Which tells you that just kind of a a, a habit that she, you know, her process and how she goes about her day, she rarely uses the left side for some reason. That's what that tells me. I love that all these little visual cues are able to be picked up, and we're able to make these inferences about who the this person is and what they does or what they do and all of these things and also what kind of person they are you wouldn't look at this and assume that this was a woman who goes out with a full face of makeup every single day and goes to the opera and right like you you look at this and you assume that this is a this is a very earthy down-to-earth person who likes to work hard and enjoys the kind of rustic nature of the things that they do um and of course, she may be somebody who does the other things as well. But when you look at this image and you imagine her character, right? Like those are the kinds of things that you that you imagine. Tell us a little bit about this lady, Matt, before we jump on to the next yeah, stuff. You, everybody nailed today. it all. Um, she is a very well-known baker in the area. She's opening a bakery right next to my studio as we speak. Um, she is Lithuanian, has been baking her entire life, comes from a line of bakers. Um, and I was doing their personal branding for her and her partner who are opening this bakery. And this was literally the last shot of the day. She's like, I got this bread. Can I take a picture with this bread? And I was like, sure, get on over here. And so she literally just threw her apron on that she had in her car, threw that on, held the bread, maybe one, maybe two frames. And this was it. And everything that you said, um, absolutely ties in. She works incessantly, um, and is very focused on her work. This is her outfit just about every day. So yeah, the personality is all right there. You guys all nailed it. Love it. Look how evocative clothing is. Ah, I love it so much. Okay. So I think this is an interesting one. And, and I think this will be our last one for today, but I really wanted to look at this one because there is there's a lot happening here that um, that culturally and clothing wise, we may not be able to pick up on without some knowledge of this time period, but not having that, um, I want to just let us see what we can get. And I'm going to give us a second to see it broad and then I'll scooch in a little bit so we can see so we can see the clothing.
So what do we see? Is that an this iPad on the left? Yep. Okay. <laughs> He's watching a movie with his breakfast. He's like some YouTube. threatening the Pope, you know. <laughs> I have a lot of questions about what's going on here. Yeah. It's very interesting. I can feel the weight of all of these fabrics, these heavy velours and like it just feels oppressive. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> but I'm like, God, how long did it take to put all that shit on? The workout is real. <laughs> the, the difference in style between the center character and everyone else is so distinct. I love that earring. I know. Me too. Those boots. Those and boots. the boots. Right? All the embroidery. I'm going to go wear this later. <laughs> <laughs> so can anybody make any guesses or inferences here? Erica's got to leave us this morning. Thanks for being here, Erica. I mean, it's definitely giving like aristocracy. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's feeling like you're at court or with the monarch's tea time, right? And you've got the yeah. servants and the counselors around and. Yep. Folks definitely noticing a hierarchy happening here. Lindsay wondering if this is morning clothes. Um, on uh, you know the darkness that's there gene say i'm seeing tea time between a government official and a wealthy woman um there's definitely a, a hierarchy a tiered hierarchy that's happening here so has our center character bursted into this monarch and or aristocrats breakfast were they allowed in like what so yeah Gosh. We're guessing like monarch or monarch or aristocrat, right? And we have several visual keys that 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 tell us those things. Partly the, the environment that they're in. This is obviously a wealthy home. But if you start looking at clothing, this these kinds of things are wool, right? Look at the shine that's added to the paint here. And if let me go in a little bit, whoops, so we can really see the way that this is painted. So the way that fabrics react to light often gives you a cue as to what kind of fabrics they are. Bye. Um, these are all matte, right? Which tells you that these are wool or cotton or these are not, these, the, the weaves there are not quite the same as what's happening here. If you notice the highlights that are, that are happening in here, Right. Like these are the kinds of things that are woven with silks or gold threads or that kind of stuff. This is a dressing jacket. So what we have here is this dude sitting down to tea. He's wearing his dressing jacket. Let's take a look at his shoes real quick. That's the kind of shoe that's like made of silk and embroidered and beaded with like either glass beads, potentially crystal beads. Like, you know, there there's fancy ass things happening there. Somebody ready here to butter his his toast for him. Well, I'm, I'm going to bring it in today's uh, today's times and a little bit tongue in cheek. This looks to me like a food critic who's visiting a, a restaurant. And <laughs> Um, that's what it looks like to me. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to tell you. Oh, go ahead, Becca. Oh, I just, I'm very curious about the, the, the women on the side. And gonna, mm -hmm. we've also got dainty little shoes and nice clothes under this. I mean, is it some sort of morning shawl? I don't know. But the old woman is also very curious. And I'm wondering if she's symbolic or literal. It so, speaks handler to me. Like <laughs> she's a pimp. Or that. All right. And that all is right, a prostitute. Right. I'm into it. This is called oh. the temptation. And this is a prostitute showing up. This is the so and and that's why I said if we're not familiar with these times at all and what clothing signified during these times, there are a lot of things that we're not going to pick up on. Dressing gowns were not worn just at any time of the day. They were worn in the morning. He is having his morning tea. The prostitute is showing up. 
the, a, few, a couple of the things that we look at here. Number one, skirts were shorter during this time a little bit because you needed to keep them out of the mud, right? And you needed to keep them out of the gunk. However, her skirt is much shorter if we see how much ankle is actually showing here. She also has her head covered. That was not just something you did. If you think about women during this time, your hair was an accessory all by itself. Wealthy women had very elaborately styled coiffures, right? And when you went to parties, they put things like ships in their hair. Like, hair was a big um, statement about who you were, where you were in society, where you were going. If you had a very well-done wig that said many things about you, she is not wearing a wig and her head is covered. So these are cues that if we don't know these things, we're not going to be able to pick up on them. And they would, when we read it, we are starting to read things that make more sense to our time, like black being a mourning clothing, people covering their head out of mourning, right? As opposed to covering their head out of regular people shouldn't be seeing me. Like, this is not the kind of woman that people would see on the sidewalk and say hello to, right? Um, and then clothing, obviously, she's, she's not a poor woman, or the clothing that is purchased to sell her in is not of poor quality. And then a little clue up here. We have some, some sexy ladies <laughs> happening in this painting. And then really good chances that this is probably a manservant, probably somebody hired um, or potentially, unfortunately, um, bought. Um, the styling of the clothing is um, probably more foreign in nature, which was a common thing. You wanted your manservant to look like exotic, right, during this time period for, for wealthy white folks in the West. Um, so a lot of things happening with clothing here. Some things that we wouldn't be able to read if we didn't have any experience or knowledge of the time period. And I want to grab, I'm pretty sure. So I need to go learn more about prostitutes. <laughs> this says it is the temptation made by Pietro Longhi um, or Pietro Falca, I guess, depending on where you're from. With remarkable matter of factness, the arrival of a prostitute and her procuress, which is a very nice way of saying pimp, are announced to a gentleman wearing a dressing gown having his breakfast. A second cup and saucer suggests that her visit has been anticipated. The intermediary may be a manservant, although his clothing is decidedly ostentatious, which was relatively common during that time if you hired somebody from a place other than your own. Here's what it looks like in its frame. Um... Let me see if I can share that real quickly. Thank you to the Met um, for all their goodies here. It's, it's lovely frame there. Here's what it looks like in its frame entirely. So let's go ahead and... Does it say where this, where this uh, painting was? So the painter the himself Met? is Italian um, and so potentially maybe coming from Italy, um, but it doesn't give any additional information, unfortunately, no. So, um, sorry, let me stop the screen share real quick. It is time for final thoughts. I'm gonna say goodbye to my hubs real quick before he heads in. Um, time for final thoughts, y'all. What do you want people to walk away with understanding about how we think of clothing and wardrobe when it comes to art? As someone that doesn't use it a whole lot in what I do, this has been really interesting to look and see just how much gets portrayed through wardrobe, right? And through styling and clothing. And everyone's like, yeah, no shit, Matt. Like that is exactly the point of the whole thing. Um, but it's amazing to me just to look at very simple images from the initial um, maternity all the way through to these heavy wools, like subconsciously it, it portrays so much. And I just never thought of it that way. I didn't put any styling effort into the Baker woman or not too much into the sniper. So it doesn't really resonate with me, but now I'm seeing just the impact that it really has and why people like Lindsay and Nicole and Becca, and, you know, put so much time into the styling because that just elevates the image so much more. And I took it for granted. Yeah, they get clothes on, you know, so. Go ahead, Becca. 
Oh, well, that's something that's so cool about photography and portraiture in general is that you get to draw these conclusions and like have this impact on you as audience based on what someone does for themselves. What your, you know, Green Beret sniper is wearing and what's important to him tells a story about him. What the baker is wearing, what she has in her car is telling something about her. I mean, even if, if you're just a street photographer and you're out taking photos with people, you know, anywhere, you're getting all that information from that wardrobe styling that people have done for themselves. So it doesn't necessarily have to be executed by you. It's part of that process of capturing someone's authentic self when you have them bring that to you in your studio or, you know, wherever it is that you're shooting. Sorry, I wanted to leave space there for a reply. I wasn't sure. Um, no. Yes. <laughs> Yes, you're doing no. it that. Good job. Yeah, no. No, I, th I think you're absolutely right, Becca. And, and that's, I think, what I take for granted a lot in the type of photography that I do, which is very personality driven, very connection driven, is I don't want to influence too much. And I just want to capture who the person is. And so um, I think that's the reason why I take a lot of it for granted, because I see it so often of just people bring their own personality. And it's, I, I say kind of hands off for the stuff that I do. Um, but seeing all of what you guys saw really just made me think more and more and more about, all right, maybe I should, maybe I should pay attention to this. Um, so I don't know. I'll become a photographer someday. <laughs> I mean, I think it's worth saying, like, I've witnessed this where if, if you're like over styling maybe, or like dressing someone in something that they wouldn't actually wear, um, you're going to be running into these problems where that story becomes uncomfortable and you can see that in the photograph. Um, so, I mean, I think you're uh, pretending to be a photographer is working out just fine. <laughs> <laughs> I love the fact that you guys have mentioned. Um, so I want to grab this from Sharon really quickly. I'm glad to be part of the chat today and thanks everybody for sharing your work. Have a great weekend. You too, Sharon. Um, I just want to kind of say, as you were saying, Becca, we're talking about visual literacy as it relates to art, but this is life. When we look at people, we see their clothing and we immediately start making interpretations. We cannot help it. That's part of our nature as visual creatures is that we see these things and we start making guesses as to who this person is. Where do they fall in society? What kind of person are they? Um, when you see somebody walking down the street and they're in very workaday clothing, that like, here's an example. My dad was a very particular type of man. My dad was a Carhartt work boots, um, you know, old worn jacket. The, this this particular part of the cuff and the sleeve is always going to be tattered with holes in it. His jacket would have uh, pin mark burns, so little burn holes, right? That are very indicative of a welder. Um, there are, if you saw my dad in the clothing that he regularly wore, it would be very clear to you what he did as a profession and what kind of man he was, because the things that he wore were fitted to his job and his lifestyle. If he went fishing, you knew he was going fishing because he probably had a pair of waders and he had warm stuff on and you would know these things. Um, and we do this without consciously realizing that we're doing it which is why so many times people talk about what you wear as a way to make you feel a certain way. If you put on a ball gown, it makes you feel a certain way, but it also tells people something about you. And so when we are making clothing choices for art, whether that is for art that we're creating or for clients that we're working with, we have the option to be very particular in how those things, not only what type of clothing we're wearing, as we saw with the, the images that either were taken back in the day or look like they were taken back in the day. Those, those visual cues are always there to help us interpret the things that we see. And we have that ability to use those things to our advantage. That does not mean that we can't remove them entirely and still create absolutely stunning images. People who do fine art nudes, and as we saw with Bassam's work, even with Matt's work, the simplicity of those things are still going to tell a story. Even when you remove them, the fact that they're not there tells part of the story. So that is just one of these elements of understanding what we see that is going to come into play, not only when we're making art, but in everyday life. And should you choose to make that part of your arsenal, you absolutely can. If you choose to have nothing to do with it or nothing to say, just recognize that the people who see the work are still going to interpret it, whether you chose for that to be part of your toolbox or not. Um, 
So if you do portraits with people head and shoulders and they're wearing no shirt at all, that also says something about the purpose of the image, um, even if you chose to remove it entirely. So every day, it's a great exercise is to start looking, just start noticing people and start, no, no that's wrong. You notice, you notice people already. Start noticing yourself, notice people. So when you see somebody, those initial thoughts that come into your head, take a second to examine those. If you walked by and you thought, oh, I wanna stay away from that person. What was it about them that made you think that? Was it what they were wearing? Was it their expression? Was it the way that they move? Um, start noticing the way that people wear their clothes and you will start, it's, it kind of becomes Holmesian, right? Like that's one of those, those things that you, oh, they have a tear here or this is brand new or that they must be coming from the gym. You're, you're making these inferences all the time. So notice yourself doing that, recognize that that is happening and then understand that when people look at your art, they're going to be doing that as well. Deep breath. Okay. Um, thank you so much to everybody for being here today for our live stream, looking at visual literacy, this time focusing on wardrobe and how that helps tell a story, how we interpret that as the viewer and the ways that we can make an effort to control or leave that up to fate. Um, we will be together again, of course, next week at 7 a.m. Mountain Standard Time. That's 6 a.m. for the West Coast and 9 a.m. for the East Coast on Mondays and Fridays until we finish our visual literacy breakdown course. Not sure what to call it. Um, but we will be together on the 25th. So we have, I have, I should say, brought together a panel of artists to talk about AI um, and how that is going to, how they see that impacting the future of art. So we will have, Becca will be with us, of course, as somebody who's already using these things. Um, Dennis Dunbar is going to be with us. Renee Robin is going to be with us. Tyler Jacobson is going to be with us. Bryce Chapman is going to be with us. Um, um, Hilmar is going to be with us. Kate is going to be with us. I'm trying to think of like everybody who's going to be there. Um, Dean Samet is going to be there who he owns Neo stock and photo manipulation.com. So we're going to be like having people from all aspects of the art industry talk about how they're using AI if they are why they don't like it if they don't and how they see it impacting the future of the industry. So that is going to be the 25th at 7 PM. So instead of our normal Thursday, that's going to be happening then. So I encourage everybody to join us, come in and ask questions and give your thoughts because AI is coming on hard. And if we don't have ideas about how we're going to approach it or use it or not use it um, purposefully, then we're just going to be kind of riding, not even riding the wave, we're going to be getting crushed by the wave. So we have some important decisions to make on how and whether we're going to be to be using that stuff. So be there with us for that. Until then, have an amazing weekend, go forth and make art. And we'll see everybody on Monday morning. Bye, friends.